more of a debugger than a programmer, and that is sort of what I have to talk about here <coughs> in a roundabout way. So, uh, how many of you actually program in systems which run on multiple machines? More than two machines, right? Uh, so, in some, uh, most of the time, when people talk about debugging things, they do not talk about uh, debugging in production, right? The thing that I have to actually talk about is how, when stuff doesn't work in production, the basic toolkit that you have to carry to actually have any hope of debugging anything. At the lowest layer of the plant. Because most of the time, nobody is actually going to tell you what went wrong in explicit sense. The difference between a good program and a bad program is that the bad programmer's code doesn't work. The difference between a good programmer and a great programmer is when the great programmer's code doesn't work, it tells you why it didn't work. Right? And Personally, I spent more time debugging an issue that could be fixed by one line than writing hundreds of lines of code all by myself from scratch. So, this is one slide that I found and I don't really think I should try to make it again. Of all the tools that I have always used, packed into one single slide. Uh, let's list them out. Uh, people raise their hand if I, you know what I'm talking about. Let's trace. Netset. Okay. What is Netset useful for? It is network communication between two machines or IP address. It gives us statistics of the network packets. Uh, not that is not the only thing it does. So what Netset gives you that is very useful is that it tells you what the open connections are right now. So when you log into a machine and you think that it should be connected to X Y Z machines and you think it is connected to the wrong machine. You can immediately figure out by running a netstat hyphen T N, right? Which says TCP. Do not figure out the domain name of the IP. Uh, the other thing netstat is really good for is finding out what domain secrets are open. Who is reading it is not given by netstat. Uh, can somebody tell me how to figure out which process owns uh, a listening socket? Netstat does that as well. So Netstat, when run in sudo mode, tells you which port is bound to which PID and what is the command line option of it. This is not terribly useful where I work because everything says Java. Uh, but after you get the PID, then you get to use something very interesting called the proc file system. Uh, any guesses on what proc stands for? So the kernel exposes something to the user to give you an idea of what each process is doing. So, after you figure out which socket is, li is it listening to, you can go to slash proc slash PID slash FD and find out all the files kept open by that process. Maybe your process is reading the wrong configuration file. Maybe your process is writing to a file you don't think it is writing to. You use that to figure all that stuff out. Uh, now, let's see. Uh, Top. Okay, what does top do? Top gives you the processes, uh, resource, uh, and the uses of the uh, resources of the system. Okay, top gives you which process is taking up CPU. Not only that, top gives top. If you open top and press one, it will give you which CPUs are being used right. Uh, VM set. What is a useful thing about VM stack? What is bad about page faults? There are many page faults, and that means your virtual space needs to be increased. Yeah. Uh, basically, it tells you that you're you're running out of memory in some fashion, more than anything else. Uh, let's see. S trace. Okay. Uh, what is the okay? I'll tell you why I use S trace the most. I will run a command. It will say 
If I will edit the configuration file, I will run a command and it will have no clue that I edited the configuration file and it will be reading some other configuration file. And you will read the manual, it will say something. If you will Google for it and it will say Ubuntu has this, Red Hat has this configuration file and Gentoo has this configuration file. Without actually telling me exactly which configuration file I should edit. So, I use strace-e file command to figure out exactly which files are being opened. Right? Uh, can you think of anything else that S2S will be very useful in? Network connections. Yes. So it will actually print out the size and buffer of each read call. So if you have given a 600 MB buffer to read and it is reading 4 KB at a time, you know that you are doing something stupid. Uh, my personally most funny experience is using a 900 byte buffer. And first time I read it, it gives me 900 bytes. Next time I read it, it gives me 400 bytes. Anybody want to guess why? <coughs> From a network sorry. Because the NTU is 1500 bytes on network. Yes. So the first read comes out of the first 1500 byte packet I got. Next 400 bytes comes out of the same packet. And then, instead of waiting for the next packet, it exits immediately. So, S3S helped me quickly figure out that I was doing two read calls, but I should have done one read call with the right buffer size. Right? Uh, IOSTAT. Anybody has struggled to use IOSTAT? Yes. Just kind of. So, uh, right now, what I'm debugging is balancing disk usage in Hadoop. So, we, we run with like 24, 25 disks, and when you run a command, it round robins between all disks. And there's no real scheduling, global scheduling. Now, what would be ideal if you could pick a disk which is not being used right now? Which is very hard. But the alternative, the how we end up trying to figure out if it is non-optimal or not, is by running IOSTAT and figuring out two things. What is the block size being written? What is the what what is the block size is being read? Or rather, number of blocks being read and the bandwidth you're writing. Uh, if the number of blocks you are reading is very large and you are getting a small bandwidth, it basically means that you are reading from many, many, many parts of the disk instead of reading from one part of the disk in a sequence. Anybody want to guess why reading one sequence is faster? No. Not the cache. No, because you don't seek too many times. Yes. Basically, it, disk is written on a cylinder and you just read that cylinder. You keep following that cylinder without moving the head. If the file is not fragmented. Okay. Yes, if the file is not fragmented. You don't even need the file to be fragmented. The other thing is, if you accidentally happen to run uh, RAID 0 on software mode and you're writing data and you want to figure out which among your 24 disks is the one that is writing data slower or reading data slower, use something like IOSTAT and block trace. Uh, IOTOP is slightly different. What is IOTOP? <coughs> Yeah. Which process is reading how much right now? Yes. Which process is reading how much, but it doesn't tell you which process is reading how much from which file. Right? Uh, it, 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 as anybody would guess, this is guesswork after you figure out what process is making a problem, but uh, I was a DevOps guy at Zynga, and most of the time when you are called in to fix something, nobody is actually going to tell you what all things are running. They are just going to tell you it is not working, please fix it and you have half an hour to fix it, right? At that point, you at least have to be able to triage a bug and see this is the person who is to blame in that half an hour, at the very least. For situations like that, these tools are tremendously useful. Um, let's pick Perf is too high tech for most production systems because you don't want the production system to be slowed down by Perf counter. But when you are developing stuff, it makes a bigger bigger difference than when you are actually have it in production. Uh, TCP dump. Dumps TCP data. But does it only dump TCP? What, what level does it capture? It gives you link frames, which basically means it gives you Ethernet frames, raw Ethernet frames. And you need it on a day when some two people have put the same IP for different machines. <coughs> right? 
you do a TCP dump and you realize that in this machine, this IP is this MAC address, and this machine, this IP is that MAC address. And when you, until you run into something like this, you will never realize that you need a tool like this. Uh, nobody needs to really think about ping, but uh, can you think of something better than ping to use? TCP trace route. TCP trace route. Yes, but there's a very nice one called MTR Linux. Yes. Which tells you where in the entire packet chain packets are getting dropped. Right. And very soon we'll need something even better because multi-part TCP is coming, which basically means that a packet link here is not always going to go through the same device in all directions. So if you're if you're on a phone and you're connected to Wi-Fi and data plan, your TCP transaction can start on the data plan and switch to the Wi-Fi without dropping a packet. So when similar systems get added for uh, internet servers, it is going to become fairly painful to just use ping. Right? Uh, and anybody know how ping works? So it's ICMP packet. ICMP packet, fine. What, how do you figure out which machine is, or the ping part is easy. You send it, you get it back. Traceroute is the different one. Yes. So how do you go from ping to traceroute? You set the number of, uh, the time to live. <coughs> so After that, when he hops it. Uh, increasing it by one packet. Yeah. So one number. So, you send the TTL of one, the immediate server says, no, I can't send it back. And it is because it gives a negative acknowledgement that it knows which server is it in the middle. And, uh, sorry, I think I'm done with most of the list. And the most fun bit about traceroute is the packet size you can use. Right? Is that you can try a larger and larger and larger packet to see if the network fails in the middle. And can anybody tell why you would ever run something like this? So, if you have worked with TCP, there's something called Nagel's algorithm which is meant to live with older network cards, older routers in the middle. So, the somewhere in the middle, you are using 9000 byte MTUs, big jumbo things. Except somewhere in the middle, there's one router that doesn't understand this. It says, I cannot process it. And you have to find it. That is the day where you actually use a ping with a size. You can say, how many how many bytes do you want to send in the payload to see if it goes and comes back. And ICMP is not enough. So one of the tools that is not there is HPing3. If you have ever had to deal with somebody who turns off pings. So what HPing3 does is HPing3 lets you send a TCP packet as a ping. It sends a TCP SYN packet, which is a connection initiation point. So HPing can tell you from this machine to this machine, is port 80 open through the firewall? And when you deal with somebody misconfiguring the network server in production, <coughs> these remembering that these things exist can be a complete life cycle. And every one of the things in that list is very simple in a very unique way. It's a very small does one thing tool. But when all of them are put together, it makes like an amazing toolkit to actually work with stuff in production. That's what I have to talk about. Next. Who is next? We have 10 minutes more, so if anyone wants to go up on stage and talk, you can do that. So, Gopal, a follow, follow up question to that. Yeah. Quiz for everybody. Yeah. Uh, so, you have uh, multiple interfaces on a machine. Yeah. And you want to find out actually how much bandwidth you can get. It's yeah. Maybe on a LAN, it may be on a LAN. What, what would you use? Uh, Netperf. Yeah. So, Netperf will do that, but uh, any other ways? Network, Netperf is probably the best way. The other thing that you have to. So, one of the tools that I didn't mention here is Netcat. And Netcat is the, the do all anything thing of uh, networking. So, NS, NCFNL starts a TCP server, and NC port number pipe data sends it there. So, on some networks, I have had to use Netcat to copy files from one machine to the other, 
simply because SSH is too slow. Right? So, classic example is the inside app EC2 where you have two private IPs, but the private IPs don't have SSH listing on it. So, you can't log in from one private IP to the other private IP. But port 80 is open to disposal. <laughs> so, print out the web server, start NCI.L80, send it from here to there, a tar file, untar it there. So, what you are basically running is tar hyphen C hyphen hyphen. Basically, it's output to standard output, pipe netcat, host name port 80, on the other side, netcat hyphen L80, pipe tar hyphen XHBF hyphen. So here you are tarring it onto a pipe, onto netcat, over the network, out of netcat, into tar, into a directory. And also SOCAT is worth mentioning if you prefer some netcat because it's even more. Yes, SOCAT is even better when you are dealing with domain sockets. So, what's SOCAT? SOCAT, associate. I would say that. Okay, uh, if you use HA proxy, uh, HA proxy has something called a socket interface. So you run socket HA proxy dot soc. It gives you a terminal where you can actually disable a server by hand without ever editing a configuration file. In a running HA proxy instance, you can go in and say the server number three is no longer working. Disable it. Uh, we use socket in Ringa to poke HA proxy to figure out the counters for each. <coughs> the stats socket, it will poke it and will give you like a graph <coughs> without actually having to run anything in it. Uh, P stack. P stack is another thing that you can use in this case. So, if you deal with a stack server, you can use P stack to dump the stack of that process. And P stack is much more useful than GDP because you can P stack hundreds of processes in one go in a for loop. So uh, I used to work with logs, shared memory in PHP, which basically meant hundred processes locking on the same block of shared memory, and you had to figure out which one had the lock so that you could even start debugging. So you take the 100 PIDs, restack all of them, write them to file and then grep through them to figure out which one is the one I am looking for and then GDP into that one to start debugging. And in this context, GDP is even bigger tool but nobody wants to really install GDP in production. You shouldn't install GDP in production because it basically lets you load up a process go to its memory, change something and come out. You have to use GDP before you start the process? No. You can no. use any process. Any process. <laughs> GDP, you have AT, attach, PID number, it attach. And uh, GDP can do it, it's okay, any other memory that shows up on the machine. Right? Yes. <laughs> Which basically then means that uh, you're dealing with a slightly lower level of well, you have to be rude to me. Right? Ptrace is a capability. If you don't have the capabilities, mark for your process or executable, it won't work. Yeah. <laughs> 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 